Hey guys, Michael Linares here, and welcome to SimpleNursing.com. Before we start today's video, please remember to access your free quiz and preview our cool nifty new study guides not here on YouTube. Click the link right up here at any time during this video. Breaking news here, America. We have a state of emergency here, people. We have a huge traffic jam in the heart. The clog up is on the main highways of the heart, the coronary artery. Today we're talking about STEMI, or basically a full blown heart attack caused by complete blockage of a heart artery. Now to be all fancy, the medical definition of STEMI is ST elevation myocardial infarction. We actually have our eye in the sky traffic reporter with all the details. Cardiac Carl, are you with us? Yes, Mike, we're over here looking at the coronary arteries, and boy, is it a doozy. Oh my gosh, Carl, that sounds very serious. This pileup looks serious, serious as a heart attack. Now, the problem here, Mike, is the LAD, the left anterior descending. We're talking a big SIG alert, coronary artery blockage here. Looks like we got a big clot from a pileup here, either from ruptured plaque or thrombi formation. Now take a look here, Mike, and everyone in the studio needs to look at this right here. We're talking complete occlusion of the artery right here, causing low oxygen and eventual tissue death to the muscles of the heart, known as necrosis. We will keep you updated in the studio, but as of right now, Mike, things do not look good. This has been Cardiac Carl in the Coronary Traffic Report. Back to you guys in the studio. Thank you so much, Carl. Man, that looks really serious. Now for the pathophysiology of an MI, it's actually very simple. But first, let's start with how the heart normally functions. So the blood vessels of your body act much like a highway or a freeway, if you will, transporting vital nutrients, exporting waste, but mainly delivering oxygen on RBCs, red blood cell hemoglobin attachments, kind of like oxygen delivery trucks, sending oxygen to vital organs of the body. Now, the biggest and most important highways of the body are found in the heart themselves the vessels that wrap around the heart that have big, thick highways called the coronary arteries. So guys, please write that down. That's very important. So kind of like the Autobahn in Germany, one of the biggest freeways in the world, your coronary arteries are some of the biggest in the body, pumping vital oxygen to your heart muscles to keep it alive. Now, what happens if there's a big traffic jam or accident on a highway? Well, there's definitely gonna be a blockage and a shutdown of the freeway. No cars moving. The trucks transporting things are not gonna get to where they're going and important deliveries will not be made on time. Not to mention, you'll probably be late for your next nursing class. Well guys, the same thing happens if we get a big traffic jam on the highways, the coronary arteries. But this time, the blockage is super serious. It can lead to death very, very quickly because remember, no oxygen, no life. So what's really going on in a STEMI here? Well, as you guys know, the heart's electrical conduction coordinates like normal, starting in the SA node down to the AV node, but this ventricular area stays contracted. And this happens because clogged arteries from not getting enough oxygen causes big tissue death. Basically, the patient has a really stiff, dead heart. Now, a heart attack is a pumping problem, big NCLEX tip right there, leading to cardiac arrest, the ultimate electrical problem due to muscle and nerve damage. So guys, just please remember they're two separate different things. Now, the simplest way to remember STEMI is that ST elevation heart attack that chokes the heart from oxygen is to remember dead fish rise to the top of water because of no oxygen. So guys, a dead heart causes ST elevation, the ST rises to the top because of, again, no oxygen. But what is the full patho of ST elevation? Well, let's break that down right now. Well, ST is that relaxing, that repolarizing part of the normal rhythm of PQRST. The big QRS wave is that ventricular contraction, also called depolarization. This is the moment between the S and the T wave, the moment when the ventricles are right about to relax. Now the E for elevation is something that is causing the ventricles to tighten up and stay contracted, kind of like a cramp. So what is going on here really? Now it could be due to either low oxygen in the heart muscle or high potassium causing this cramp. Both are technically ST elevations, but in this case it's low oxygen from the heart attack, or in fancier terms this myocardial infarction that is causing the ST elevation from this tissue death. 
So we need to get this patient to the cath lab and unclog those coronary arteries and reperfuse the heart with oxygen. So using our five steps, let's interpret this EKG. So step number one, the rate is regular, but honestly, who cares? Your patient is having a heart attack. The rhythm varies and the P wave's normal, the PR interval is normal, and the QRS has ST elevations. Guys, nothing really matters here except the ST elevation. Basically, the ventricles are not squeezing that oxygen-rich blood out to the body, meaning no cardiac output, basically no oxygen to the body, meaning your patient's gonna die like really soon. Now, what are the causes of a heart attack? We have a lot of risk factors, but all mainly relate to clogged or narrowing blood vessels from cholesterol or inflammation. So we use our nifty acronym da Vinci. D for deposits of plaque in the arteries, narrowing the arteries, and also diabetes from type one and type two. That puts a lot of pressure and inflammation in the heart with that super thick sugary blood, kind of like having syrup in your blood vessels. A is for angina history, narrowing of the arteries, leading to ischemia, or basically low oxygen. V is for vasospasms, a sudden constricting or narrowing of the blood vessels that can technically break off plaque and have a free-floating clot somewhere. I is for increased cholesterol over 200, also called hyperlipidemia, from animal fats or animal products, which causes a huge clogging in the arteries. But fiber, like fruits and vegetables, actually lower total cholesterol and clean out those arteries. N is for narcotic use, C for coronary artery disease, all that cholesterol coming up on the blood vessels. I is for inflammation of the heart walls. Now lastly, hypertension and heart failure put a lot of pressure and inflammation on the heart. And even tobacco use can cause scarring of the blood vessels. But some genetics play a role here too. Technically, male gender have a higher risk factor for heart attacks and family history for MI and artery disease, also called arteriosclerosis, basically a stiffening and hardening of the arteries, put a lot of pressure and inflammation on the heart. So let's go over the signs and symptoms and clinical manifestations of MI. Now, the easiest way to remember all of your signs and symptoms is simply hold your breath. Now, holding your breath, you'll have low oxygen, and naturally you'll start feeling dizzy or lightheaded, faint, which also known as syncopal, as well as lethargy or weakness. Now, all these stem from less oxygen. So during an MI, your patient will have these classic signs and symptoms. So subjectively, they'll say, I feel lightheaded like I may pass out. They will also have left substernal chest pain, also called angina, usually described as a crushing pain or a stabbing sharp pain in the back, or even indigestion and heartburn. Now this pain usually radiates from the chest down the left arm, even creeping up on the jaw and showing JVD, jugular vein distension, basically popping jugular veins here. Patients will also present with nausea, vomiting, and decreased urinary output. Now for other objective signs, we use the nifty acronym collapse. So C for chest pain, O for oxygen, SpO2 saturation that is lowered, L for lethargy and fatigue, A for anxiety, your patient's gonna be really anxious, P for palpitations or a racing heart, feeling like you have gallops under the chest, S for shortness of breath or dyspnea, basically difficulty breathing, E is for that elevated heart rate known as tachycardia, but that happens early, guys. Late signs and symptoms of MI, Usually, they'll be bradycardic or a slow heart rate. Now, D is for dizziness and even diaphoresis, also called sweating. Now, that one technically is a huge one, so write that one down. Now, for diagnostic tests, you'll do an EKG that shows ST elevation. So, duh, we're talking about STEMI here. All right, guys, so let's cover our laboratory test. The big focus is on our big cardiac enzyme labs. Our myocardial heart cells contain specialized enzymes and proteins, and when they die, well, then the membrane loses integrity, resulting in enzymes and proteins secretly secreting to the bloodstream. So if these enzymes are elevated, it could mean we're having an MI heart attack. So guys, please pause the video and write these down. So starting at the top, we have troponin. Greater than 1.5 indicates an MI, which usually decreases after seven days. Then we have troponin T, which is greater than 0 0.1 to 0 0.2, indicates an MI but it decreases after 14 days. Next is our CPK, or what's known as CK. The levels rise four to eight hours after an MI. P 
peaking between 16 to 30 hours, and then returning to normal baseline in four days. Next is myoglobin, which is nonspecific technically for an MI, but starts to increase between one to three hours and peaks at 12 hours after the onset of MI symptoms. Now over 90 could indicate an MI. We also want to check for risk factors that narrow the vessels. Now it's usually high cholesterol, so we'll pull a cholesterol panel. So cholesterol less than 200 is normal. Triglycerides less than 150 is normal. And HDLs and LDLs are a little bit tricky, so listen close. So LDLs are our bad lose lipids. At 130 or less is normal. And HDLs are our happy lipids. They're good and they're happy and they're fun. 45 or more is normal. So I know I just went really fast, guys, so please rewind and pause that video, write those down, and make sure you know them for your test. So nursing interventions for MI. Well, the biggest goal is to get from the door to the cath lab in 60 minutes or less. We're gonna get in there, open up that blocked artery, and this is the biggest priority. So we do a procedure called PCI, percutaneous coronary intervention, or basically a cath lab, get them there. Now the three procedures that we really do are either cabbage, known as a coronary artery bypass graft, Basically, we're taking the side street around the blocked artery. Or we'll do an angioplasty or coronary stents to open up that blocked wreckage and put a metal cage around that blood vessel to keep it open. Now, as far as medications during an acute MI, meaning it's happening right, right now, we're going to use Mona. So morphine, oxygen, nitro, and aspirin. I know it can be confusing. We don't do it technically in that order. Usually we give nitro, oxygen, aspirin, antiplatelet congregator, and morphine. So almost like Naomi. So maybe like Noam, Noam. So let's go to Cardiac Carl in the field to visually explain this story. Cardiac Carl, are you with us? That's right, Mike. It looks like road workers have arrived named Mona, or Noam in that order. Now, nitrogen has been given to vasodilate for more oxygen to that left ventricle. Basically, if you see right here, it has opened up more lanes on the highway. So three doses of 0.5 milligrams, five minutes apart, sublingually under the tongue have been given. O is for the oxygen because we need more oxygen to that left ventricle. Now, A is for the aspirin at 325 milligrams here. It's an antiplatelet congregator. It kind of loosens up congestion of platelets here that are all clumped together. It simply spreads them out more so they don't crowd together and cause more congestion and more blocking here. Because ultimately, Mike, the RBCs have to deliver oxygen down to that left ventricle in order for perfusion to take place. Now, M is for morphine that decreases the workload of the heart. That's a big NCLEX tip, so write that down there in your forecast. This pain drug, or analgesic, reduces the pain and anxiety, but also vasodilates the vessels kind of like nitro. Now, if you see right here, it relaxes the heart to make it pump more effectively, ultimately decreasing the stress and workload of the heart. Key word there, workload. And it also increases that cardiac output, basically getting more oxygen to the body. All right, guys, that about wraps it up here. This has been Cardiac Carl, back to you in the studio. Thank you, Cardiac Carl. Now, after your patient is discharged, they'll be on cardiac rehabilitation. Basically, kind of like summer camp for the heart. Be a supervised program that includes exercise, amazingly difficult lifestyle changes, education, and emotional support with people with heart problems. Thanks for watching. For our full video and new quiz bank, click right up here to access your free trial. And please consider subscribing to our YouTube channel. Last but not least, a big thanks to our team of experts helping us make these great videos. Alright guys, see you next time.